The thoughts, opinions, and general overall shades thrown on Hyatt 9 News are those of the individual speakers and not those of Hyatt 9 News, its audience, or its advertisers. The statements made do not constitute medical, legal, or financial advice. And for advice tailored to your specific situation, please consult with a licensed professional. Welcome to the Hyatt 9 News Hour, where you will hear from cannabis industry experts and professionals from around the country talk about important topics while shining light on global issues and discussing cannabis as it relates to politics, regulation and reform, data and technology, science, research and medicine, family and parenting, art, celebrities and entertainment, fitness, sports, mental health and wellness, and plant-based medicines and entheogenics. Together, we are building a stronger community, fighting the stigma and creating change. With your hosts, Jason Beck and Rico Lamite, joined by special industry expert correspondents from around the country and daily antics brought to you by Cannabis. Coming to you live every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time and high noon on the East Coast. And thank you all for getting high at 9 with us. Oh, yeah. Good yeah, morning, good everybody. Morning, everybody. That's right. It is Tuesday, March 26th, and today is Epilepsy Awareness Day, National Nougat Day, because everyone loves some nougat. Do you even know what nougat is, Rico? It's in a Snickers bar. It's also you national. Like you don't like chocolate fun. bars, Jason? Yeah, but but can you define nougat? It's that uh exactly. It's the shit in the middle of exactly. the exactly. It's the shit in the Snickers bar. Exactly. <laughs> it's also National Spinach Day and American Diabetes Association Alert Day. So thank you all for joining us and getting high at nine with us. It's also high noon on the East Coast. And please remember to like, share, and subscribe to us on all social media platforms. You can look down below on your screen to see exactly where we live on the Internet. And we are live every Monday through Friday on YouTube, Rumble, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on our very own website at www.highat9news.com. So welcome to everyone joining us from any one of those platforms. And uh, kicking it off, that's right, we have the dope dad himself, Mr. Rico Lameet who happened to gut his green drop in so he looks like he could drop in the studio today. Hold That's on, right. Hold on, hold on. We, do we not have Adam today? Do Adam, we, not go on green we, have, we have feathered hair right here. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 bro. We're, you're you're, you're right. going to be feathered, bro. You're going to be feathered today. <laughs> you're switching shit up on me last minute, man. I, I don't switch anything up last minute, bro. That's cute. Sure, man. Never. Sure. Never sure. in my life. Just because yeah. you can't That's remember things, it's not, it's not me switching things up. It's, it's your memory. It's a short term like memory Republican. lost. Exactly. Just saying. That's what right. What are you talking about? Uh huh. Exactly. It is the dope dad himself, Mr. Rico Lemeet. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. And uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. It is Talk About a Tuesday. We've got some shit to talk about today. Oh, man. Lots. All right. Yes, we do. Um, my question is mm -hmm. could one word worth $1 million make Virginia's Republican governor? Glenn Youngkin, soften his support for anti-woke policies. The word in question is equity. And according to Virginia Mercury's Nathaniel Klein, a new Virginia budget proposal would redirect the state diversity office funds to its cannabis business loan program. Look at that. Look at that uh, delayed applause. Uh, ER, ERO all of a sudden decided to jump in. Wanted to hit the applause okay. button, apparently. <laughs> so a... Uh, um, the word in question is equity. According to Virginia Mercury's Nathaniel Klein, a new Virginia budget pro proposal would redirect the state diversity office funds to its cannabis business loan program amid dispute over whether the word equity or opportunity is to be used going forward. Klein reported that after top Democrats and community leaders called for the firing of state diversity chief last spring over his DEI is dead comments, Jason Beck approved. Uh, the General Assembly included language in its budget to redirect funding from the Office of Diversity, Opportunity and Inclusion to a loan program to help license cannabis sellers unless equity is put back into the state's diversity office title by this summer. In January 2022, Glenn Youngkin, Governor Glenn Youngkin renamed the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion through an executive order by replacing equity with opportunity. Because petty is what Republicans do. 
Uh, contrary to state code, a move met with swift pushback from Democratic leaders. The law is diversity, equity, and inclusion, Senator Mamie uh, Locke said in an interview at the end of last year's session. The governor's press office did not respond to the Mercury's request for comment earlier this week. The governor introduced his budget proposal in December, which appropriated an estimated $2.6 million in funding over the next two years for the Diversity Opportunity and Inclusion Office, consolidated into the general fund for governor's office. If the governor instead accepts the General Assembly's proposal, the Democratic General, general Assembly's proposal, because re remember, elections have consequences and they're all Democrats now, um, a budget amendment carried by Senate Majority Leader Scott Suravel um, by July 1st. $3.6 million. They upped the ante by a cool $1 million. Over the next two years will be appropriated to the office, and its title would be Restored to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. If the governor fails to do so, the budget approved by the General Assembly would redirect the funds to the uh, Virginia Cannabis Equity Business Loan Fund. Uh, according to state law, the fund will provide no and low interest loans to qualified licensed cannabis businesses uh, and business owners to help promote business ownership and economic growth in, econ in, con in communities that were disproportionately impacted by cannabis when it was prohibited in the state. The significance of the word equity in Virginia's DEI or DOI office is historically immense. Janice Underwood, who served as director of diversity initiatives at OD, uh, ODU, uh, we call it ODU in Virginia, but Old Dominion mm -hmm. University, was appointed by Democratic Governor Ralph Northam in September 2019 as the state's first director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was the first position of its kind in the entire country. So in 2020, lawmakers passed legislation to codify the law, um, into law, the diversity, equity, and inclusion director position in the governor's cabinet. History was made. Uh, um, according to the state law, the DEI director is responsible for developing a plan to promote inclusive practices across state government and address systemic inequities in state government practices. The director must also implement feedback from state employees and other groups into equity policy. The position was part of the governor's response to racial inequity in Virginia, thrown into stark relief by the killing of George Floyd, a black man, by a white Minneapolis police officer. It was also related to the state's comm uh, commemoration of the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans coming to Virginia. The new position came months after controversy prompted by a photo that uh, surfaced of Northam's 1984 Eastern Virginia Medical School yearbook picture depicting someone in blackface and another in KKK robes. Since the positions established, three people have been appointed as chief diversity officer uh, following Underwood. It was uh, Governor Yunkin in January 2022 appointed Angela Saylor as the role uh, to the role and changed the office title to diversity opportunity and inclusion during the first month of his tenure. Saylor previously served as an executive at the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank. Martin Brown, who served as the commissioner of the Department of Social Services, succeeded Saylor in November 2022, also appointed by Yunkin. Some of Brown's notable actions included supporting legislation to permit the placement of historic signs identified in the Green Book and champ uh, championing controversial changes to the state's history standards adopted by the Board of Education, a la Meatball Ron. <laughs> Yeah, just copying uh, whatever Meatball Ron does, it sounds like. Um, perhaps most notably, Brown faced widespread criticism for his remarks during a speech at the Virginia Military Institute last April, where he said this. Let's take a moment right now and kill that cow. DEI is dead. We're not going to bring that cow up anymore. It's dead. It was mandated by the General Assembly, but this governor has a different philosophy on civil discourse, civility, living the golden rule. Right? Am I right? <laughs> he actually said this shit. So uh, I miss Virginia. I really, really miss you. Uh, last year, Democrats questioned whether the governor was following the law when he changed the name of the position. In a letter sent to Attorney General Jason Miares, Senator Scott Cervell, and uh, Delegate Don Scott wrote, the official state website for this office uh, likewise uses an incorrect name and refers to Mr. Brown as the Commonwealth of Virginia's Chief Diversity, Opportunity, and Inclusion Officer, noting that the DEI title mandated by the state did not appear on the state website which is illegal. 
Uh, Mayor has uh, responded that if the governor makes sure the, uh, the state's laws relating to the DEI office are faithfully executed, he may include within his cabinet a chief diversity opportunity and inclusion officer who was charged with performing duties supplemental to those of the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's petty on both sides. So um, fast forwarding over here. So this whole, this whole equity in, uh, on trial uh, dispute is very interesting, both because it's not so different than the struggles that the cannabis industry has faced over the years in defining what social equity even means. Municipality to municipality, state to state, nobody can truly agree on what it means, right? Um, so it's something that we've faced over years, defining social equity and the fact money earmarked to support what Virginia defines in their own version of social equity and cannabis to be is what is at stake here, given Youngkin's response to the proposal. The public lynching of George Floyd uh, forced American society into a moment of, ro of racial reckoning. In the incident's wake came a wave of economic support for Black and BIPOC businesses and business initiatives, efforts to inject diversity, equity, and inclusion along supply chains of every American business seemed like it'd be the new norm. In the era of capitalists turning a blind eye to discriminatory practices in favor of whites in comparison to their counterparts of color would soon be a thing of the past. Four years later, DEI has become the dirty acronym most hated by conservative capitalists, hell-bent on reversing the pendulum swing and bringing back the good old days where boys can be boys. However, a million bucks is a million bucks. Is Glenn Youngkin going to go for that bait? Or is he just going to veto this, right? So I think it's going to be the latter. But either way, this is very interesting to see if he's going to choose the money or doing the right thing by his people. I'm Rico Lamit, the dopest dad on the street for High at Nine News. Let's talk about it. What y'all think? <laughs> Back to the days when boys could be boys? Virginia. <laughs> Virginia's for lovers, I <laughs> What is that I about? Go Back to the days of racism and slavery. I visibly right? winced <laughs> hearing <laughs> that. I don't know if anyone saw that, but when that comment came across, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> me too. I mean, uh, this is Virginia. Life was so much better back then. Oh my god! So, uh, so my senior year in high school, man, um, in my civics class, uh, this is the year two thousand. We mm -hmm. go to the uh, state general assembly where they're voting on changing Martin Luther King Day to King Lee Jackson Day, Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee, two Confederate traitors, but they consider them heroes in Virginia. And um, it lost by two votes. It was silently pushed into law two years later when I was a, a, a sophomore in college. So this is Virginia. I mean, Virginia is the northernmost state of the South. Virginia was the capital of the South. Isn't Virginia for lovers? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I always thought. It was for lovers. It's the love. northernmost state yeah, in the yeah. South. Mason Dixon goes through Maryland. It was yeah, part if, of if you, yeah. if you can define love, you can define equity, I guess. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Right. I mean... The Mason-Dixon line must have been on that bridge that just uh, collapsed in Maryland. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! Wait, that that bridge did not collapse. That was a domestic terrorism too hit. Soon. Oh, that was, was, that was hit by that was domestic terrorism. There's no way he could not have missed that. That was totally intentionally. Done. Jason's Jason's been listening to Andrew Tate conspiracies all morning. Already. No, I haven't. <laughs> this is my own, terms, own. There's no way he. It was intentional. 100. percent It was intentional. What do you guys think about this? Uh, about Early this on. Yeah, about non intentional by the by the operator, by the pilot, right? No, on. that's what, impossible. What do you think about the story? What are you thinking about? Uh, what do you uh, think the story about this Virginia, Simon? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't have any faith for for Virginia, Rico. I hey, like yeah. that, but I don't. My I lost all faith. I lost all faith on the East Coast, you know, except for my homies in Maine holding it down, making that fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keeping the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I really, um, I think that, I just think that the, like, Virginia, West Virginia, um, you know, anything that's, like, in that close of proximity to the to the uh, Washington D.C. swamp, as they call it, I think it's just, it's just bound to just take forever to get there should in line and to make a, an actual industry there mm -hmm. i think it's just going to be you know i think it's just going to be the same stuff going on i i, I don't see mm -hmm. a big change happening for virginia until the you know until this country kind of gets it together and then maybe there's a glimmer of hope for virginia country but that's, you know this is just more of the same glenn youngkin is worthless 
So you know. the country ain't well, going to get back. I think, it, I think it's worse than worthless because one of these sort of golden rules in American government is this separation between church and state. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty important to most Americans, even Americans who have a deep faith that is rooted in something outside of themselves and where they've gone to some sort of house of religious worship and gotten spiritually edumacated. And this, de this, 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 this line between church and state it tends to be really, really important. I'd, I'd say it's almost foundational to, to, to this form of government that we both love to celebrate and criticize here on the show. And what's really challenging is that uh, Martin Brown, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he served as, uh, you know, as a commissioner of the Department of Social Services, uh, and he was appointed by this governor. And what he said when yep. he said that DEI is dead is he said that, quote, take a moment right now to kill that cow. DEI is dead. Brown said, we're not going to bring that cow up anymore. He's definitely bovine shaming, but that's a whole nother story. He says, it's dead. It was mandated by the General <laughs> Assembly, but this governor has a different philosophy of civil discourse, civility, living the golden rule, right? And so that golden rule is a precept in the gospel of Matthew 7-12. Uh, and and, wow. and, it, and so, so, it's, it, so if you're going to be bringing in biblical quotes while you're talking about public right. policy in a country that was founded, founded on the notion of a separation between church and straight. That, that That's very challenging. But what's extra challenging is that the golden rule is a moral by which says you treat others how you would want to be treated. And this moral is in various forms has been used as a basis for society, many cultures and civilizations. And it's called the golden rule because it's basically this value and having the kind of respect and caring attitude that you would have for somebody else. And so if you're gonna be in public policy, if you're gonna be an elected official or appointed official, you're gonna be in government, to not have that separation between church and straight state is a big, big no-no. But then to quote the Bible and to talk about the golden rule about treating other people as you would wanna be treated yourself in a state and in a region of this country that doesn't have a perfect track record on this, right? That has a history that is not inconsequential in this conversation about how other people deserve to be treated. Um, it's troubling on a lot of different levels. It presupposes that we all come from the same faith and the same book, um, but it also takes those those thoughts, those 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 ideals that were expressed in this religious book, and doesn't adequately apply them to this situation. And so that for all of those reasons, this gives me a lot of heartburn. I just I, mean, say, I just think Glenn Youngkin needs to go meet the the sisters of the cloth, the 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 the, the, the nuns of the valley, uh, you know, making oh making the perpetual the, the sisterhood thing. in yeah. God's name. I what think they that's what, a, what 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 they all these um, religious um, antics and people that want to bring uh, religion in re, in regards with the uh, the cannabis uh, uh, debate, they need to go back to the first book, Genesis, where it clearly states that God made all plants of this earth and they're all to be used and consumed. And th that just needs to start that conversation there. We need to get back to, to a, in touch with some little bit of reality before we want to start putting all this different jargon and, and whatnot in places when it comes to religion. Religion isn't reality, though. It's subjective belief. Religion is reality, bro, because perception is reality. Subjective belief. <laughs> coming with the bar, dropping uh -huh. the bar. Mm -hmm. GOP keep on mixing this one. religion into the laws. I mean, I'm, I'm with Jason your... on this one. Like, See? if you think back to Waco, I think is a really good example. Um, mm -hmm. Their reality wasn't real for anybody else but them. Exactly. And they deeply believed, based on their scripture, that what was going to happen was going to happen the way it was and that they were being persecuted according to their yep. scripture. And that lived out according to their reality, right? Like, mm -hmm. and how much of that was real and instigated. I think that's like kind of the perfect example of how religion um, actually, whether we think it's, it is subjective, but it does become reality because that's how people act and it's the world frame that they believe in. So it's like you have to tango with that and get on that level to interrogate it. Otherwise, you're going to miss them. And I, I think Waco is a really good example of that personally. Mm -hmm. And it applies. I mean, I think Waco is a very extreme uh, kind of like 
I, I don't think so here i think this is i think this is definitely so. that's a little that's a little far out there but i mean what no. it is is like oh boy you have religious groups you have christian religious groups like these ladies like the nuns in they're the not christians Valley. those are catholics bro nuns are catholic whatever, get your bro, religions whatever, correct bro. bro if you're gonna talk about yeah, religion yeah, you gotta get it correct you're splitting hairs bro you're splitting hairs same thing what are you talking about no it's not bro catholicism is christian but i mean it to show an example of how you misunderstanding other people and how those things that could have been easily solved through some understanding and getting on their world level and getting on their view a lot could have been avoided and i think that that's the point of that. mm -hmm. i think it's safe to say that those people equity and cannabis in virginia look at that look at the glimmer of hope <laughs> yeah <laughs> shout yeah. out elise coming through in the clutch that's right there it's least on the it's least yeah, and they're not calling it communist uh communist equity or anything like that you guys i mean come on the communist all... commonwealth huh? mm -hmm, exactly <laughs> but we got to go to a commercial we're gonna be right back Hey, you, America. Do I look like Sean Connery? <laughs> Good morning, America. Saman Razani coming to you live from sunny Los Angeles, California with the one and only highest host, Mr. Jason Beck, smoking on the best weed in the world. Did you know that we have an audio-only version of our podcast? You can find it on Apple google amazon iHeartRadio, and spotify no excuses in 2024 if you haven't checked us out check it out now and also check out what the prophet's doing in 2024 <laughs> oh, next mm -hmm. we have high at nine news is uh, diversity chief himself yeah <laughs> that's cute no, that's that's cute. One of the best in the world <laughs> in the highest republican in any chamber of congress my man, Jason Beck. What do you have for us today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Rico. Oh, man, I tell you what, bro. I got a very interesting story, you guys. Some of you guys, some of you might actually know. Because a legal pot pioneer was busted in Idaho with 56 pounds. And they say he has a plan, you guys. And no, it's not dog face, you guys. In retrospect, the Idaho shortcut might have been a bad idea. The mission had already begun to go sideways when Dana Beal, a pioneer of New York's marijuana legalization movement, but someone who has never obtained a driver's license, enlisted a ketamine enthusiast to chauffeur him across America. Um, sounds like a reality show already. Or perhaps that fateful moment when Mr. Beal decided to avoid the cold by staying in the minivan conked out on the shoulder of Interstate 84 that forced the helpful state trooper to come over and get a nose full of the 56 pounds of weed that Mr. Beal was bringing back to New York. In reality, there were any number of chances Mr. Beal 77 to avoid his current situation facing felony drug trafficking charges carrying a potential 15-year prison sentence. Mr. Beal has spent nearly six decades challenging pot laws and as a fixture of New York's agraying counterculture, famous for handing out joints at rallies, he has undertaken many weed-buying odysseys and has wiggled out of, out of scores of arrests across the country. Usually, anyway. Now, now, despite the broad legalization of cannabis, he has managed to get arrested in one of the strictest states in the country and finds himself in his most serious jam yet. That's right. After his January 15th arrest, not January 6th, you guys, he spent nearly two months in jail and a fortune in prepaid phone time to mobilize his network of activists to raise a bond payment on his $250,000 bail, which freed him on March 9th. He was rejected. He rejected an offer to a plead to plead guilty and serve a year and says he will roll the dice at trial. He now says he will stick around Idaho. He has a plan, you guys. Maybe it's peeling potatoes. Who knows? My le in quotes, he says, my legal strategy now hinges on me helping to legalize marijuana in Idaho, Mr. Beal said. Mr. Beal has made a life out of penutrious activism, and he was an early member of the Youth International Party, the yuppie movement known for a dadasque pranks and a theatrical Vietnam War protests, and he lived for years in the group's Greenwich Village headquarters before, he, uh, before the place was foreclosed upon in 2014. 
He left civil rights de- demonstrations and, fun- and, and furnished medical marijuana for AIDS and cancer patients. He helped organize Rock Against Racism concerts and the Global Marijuana March. He put together hundreds of smoke-ins, demonstrations, marches, and parades and made cross-country smuggling runs to both finance his activism and procure pot to hand out at events where he could be found carrying a giant inflatable joint in quotes no one has pushed for legalization of pot in new york for so many years as dana said john penley a friend of mr beals and a legalization advocate and in 2021 he succeeded when new york legalized marijuana as much of the rest of the country has but legal weed has no panacea the prices of medical and adult use in adult use dispensaries were 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 too steep for mr Mr. Beale and his longtime circle, many of whom live on fixed incomes, and Mr. Beale himself was couch surfing in Manhattan after being booted out of an attic out of a midtown synagogue where he spent the pandemic in lockdown. So Mr. Beale continued his weed runs in the name of affordable pot for all and also to raise money for his other legalization crusade, a banned psychoactive uh, vegetable substance called it. Ibogaine, I B O G A I N E, ibogaine. Uh, that okay. has yeah, ibogaine that has st- that has been studied as a treatment for opioid addiction, Parkinson's disease, and many other ailments. His latest scheme was to produce ibogaine abroad and then bring it to Ukrainian soldiers suffering from battlefield trauma and brain injuries. He just had finished one such mission in December before heading out, out to Oregon to buy a large amount of marijuana to resell in New York to to fund another one. It has uh, been his career finale, he says. Mr. Beale's misadventure started one day in mid-January when his ride out of southern Oregon fell through. The truck was stolen by some speed freaks and the driver relapsed, Mr. Beale said in a call from jail earlier this month. Someone put fentanyl in his ketamine. Well, it wasn't in his weed. So Mr. Beale said the, said he found another man headed east, a bet with uh, with a vehicle that wasn't up to snuff. Uh, this this he and his 56 pounds of pot were entrusted to a stranger who drove to a 2003 minivan with a dying transmission. You guys, still he had he had an, his urgent ibogaine plan to accomplish. So Mr. Beale pushed to cut through Idaho. Sure enough. The transmission expired on the interstate, and the two men and the illicit cargo glided to a stop on the shoulder just outside Twin Falls. I think that's where actually Dogface got arrested, too. In quotes, I thought we were going to pull over and then call for a tow, he said, but we were instead espied by a state trooper in less than 10 minutes this guy pulls up on us it was all bad timing he said <laughs> oh man with temperatures well below freezing mr bill wearing his unusual uh, tweed jacket and cowboy boots stayed in the vehicle another mistake he lamented forcing the state trooper to come to them and wind up getting a whiff of the cargo mr bill said he regretted not having packed an air freshener <laughs> mr bill tried his ukraine story on the trooper but who was not buying it in quotes says i told him i was bringing them the medicine they really need and now it's on you mr beale said mr beale acknowledged that the bags in the car belonged to him and the trooper said a sworn complaint the driver was released with a summons idaho is surrounded mostly by pot friendly states and uh, is strict about people driving through with the stuff the authorities are especially vigilant in corridor counties along interstate 84 of which gooding county where mr beale encountered the state police is one under state law carrying more than 25 pounds of marijuana is a felony with a mandatory minimum sentence of five years with a maximum is 15 years with a maximum fine of fifty thousand dollars in quotes it's one of the worst places in the country to possess marijuana definitely michelle agri mr beale's court appointed lawyer said idaho is stuck in the 1950s and as far as marijuana goes it's definitely the wrong place wrong time for a person to be accused of having marijuana many longtime comrades view the Idaho debacle as just another Dana Beal mishap, but he fears that his promise might tempt prosecutors to make an example or make him an example. Many longtime comrades view the Idaho debacle. Yeah, oh, excuse me. Uh, in a quote, we've reached how those decisions to legalize drugs have ruined other states, and Idaho demands just a bit better of its citizens and communities, he said. If you're trying to transport marijuana across state lines through Idaho, take the long way instead. It'll save us money 
on your incarceration. Mr. Beal is no stranger to the sale, having been arrested during countless trips to buy weed over several decades in Nebraska in 2009. He was arrested with more than 100 pounds of pot in 2011. He spent two years in a Wisconsin prison during which he had a double bypass operation after a nearly fatal heart attack and spent a week in a medically induced coma. And in 2017, he was busted with 22 pounds of illegal marijuana in Northern California after the authorities spotted him in a rental car weaving slowly across the road. He served no time then, nor after he was arrested in 2020 in Oregon, he said. And Mr. Beal was finally bailed out of the Gooding County uh, Jail this month by marijuana activist Adam Edinger and Don Ristrefire, a lawyer who founded the Cannabis Museum in Athens, Ohio. In hopes of leniency, Mr. Beal said he was trying to get Idaho prosecutors his medical records from his episode in Wisconsin. Mr. Beal's legalization efforts are a decade-long shot, and Idaho has steadfastly refused to legalize weed, but Mr. Beal said that after a trip back to New York to regroup, he will maintain a presence in Idaho for the, the fight and not to bolster his own case. In quotes, he says, it's a moral stand, he said. I'm not like the average uh, guy passing through. Last week, he was, he was crashing with a few activists in Boise and was visiting the state capitol to wrangle a meeting with a Democratic state legislator to pitch his vision of legalization. Mr. Beal said he had teamed up with an old acquaintance whom he had worked with organizing the annual Global Marijuana March and had gotten in touch with organizers at Kind Idaho, a group advocating for legal mar- medical marijuana. He is already scheduled to speak at the Boise Hemp Fest on May 11th and hopes to pack the the courtroom with activists when he appears at the court hearing shortly afterward in quotes if they didn't want to change the law in idaho he said they shouldn't have stopped me Mr. Wistraffer was uh, not not sh- uh, was was not so sure Mr. Beal is tougher political terrain than he is used to navigating. He said, but he's ir- he's irrepressible. He added, he'll make himself enough of a pain in the ass that they'll either be more vengeful in their prosecution or just get rid of him. If so, Mr. Beal said he will resume the Ibogaine mission now uh, slimed by his uh, hasty decision to cut through Idaho. And in quotes, looking back, I probably shouldn't have done that. He said, he explained, I was in a rush, man. I had to get back to Ukraine. Man, you guys, man, just, just oh, man, just some things just, what is oh, going my God. On in I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about this. The Ukraine thing is wild. It's wild, right? It's me, man. This dude's a couple tater tots short of a of a baked potato. Of a baked I mean, potato, you know? huh? Yeah. Yeah. He's those in Idaho, so he'll get well. Uh... A couple tots short. He's Yo, definitely. this guy has this guy's um pretty amazing. I mean, this is like this is the best Trojan horse you can ever send across a country. I mean, I hope people are like following this guy and like let and like watching him do his things and then just moving around him as he's getting all this attention Mm -hmm. because this is ridiculous this guy is like telling his whole he's he's snitching on himself the whole entire way exactly what is going on i don't even understand why he felt the need to tell his entire you know by you know biography to you know uh, the reporter or whoever wrote this story i it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Man. Jealous of them because they're going to get um, documentary rights, movie rights, depending on their contract. And it's going to be amazing. It's I'm the mini with, with the broken transmission for me. Like, after all of that, the <laughs> only person you could find was a beater. <laughs> Yes, have you ever been to Oregon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oregon, right? For real. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. He was probably hanging out shout over out, there. Shout out Medford. He probably met him over there in the city of Chad. Oh. He's oh, amazing. Man. I love mm-hmm. that he's on the Ibogaine mission. I mean, that is a truly powerful plant. And, you know, I just love that he's this elder crusader. And, uh, yeah, I was on the edge of my seat, that whole story. Like, that could be a Netflix story. And, of course, it's the New York Times. Like, way to go, Dana Beal, making the Times and still fighting the good fight. Like, I'm here for it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, yes, but, okay. Yes, but. Yes, but. Yes, but. And is he the right person to ride for this mission? Hold on. We need one person at a time. Yes, but, right? Like, let's not totally cloak all of this in the honorable efforts and curriculum vitae of this social justice warrior. We need to unpack this a little bit and also be willing 
feeling to, to just point out sort of the gaps in thinking and execution. You know, obviously he didn't listen to Pop Brothers at Law. He did not shut the fuck up. No, he up, did not. Okay. And right. the other part of this is this this notion of uh, civil disobedience is always better received when it is done overtly, not after you get caught for quasi covertly. And so if you're breaking the law in front of law enforcement and saying, not on my watch will something so despicable as a lack of cannabis be allowed in this state, blah, blah, blah. But that is not what this guy was doing. He was just sloppy Sally on a Tuesday and fucking up left and right. And then admitting that he, and so, and then this notion that he could sort of mutate it and conflate it into advocacy within that state when the cannabis wasn't destined for patients in that state is so nails on chalkboard. It, it reminds me of people who get held accountable and then use racism as a cover. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're being racist towards me, right? And so like mm -hmm. this guy is being held accountable, right or wrong with the laws, and then saying, oh wait, but I am this big but massive I'm advocate. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for the citizens of the state. It doesn't ring true to me. And unfortunately, I think that the judge is going to have to give him a big black eye. And he's he going to take a lump and mm -hmm. it's not going to matter all the great stuff he's done in the past. It's not going to matter the people who care about him and all the contributions across to this and across to that. This is so bad. And like, I also just wonder, like, should I go back to trap consulting? Because one of the pro tips in that is that the way in which you package your cannabis makes it not very odorific for exactly the, this idea that there could be unintended traffic stops. And so if you can't even get that fucking right, it bothers me. I agree. Yeah, with the you. posturing, yeah, the whole if they didn't want to change their laws, they shouldn't have arrested me is is just not a good look. He'll, he'll I agree. A, he'll, you know, he's falling on the sword. He'll he'll it'll be another story about how how the uh, the laws in New York caused this to happen and why he had to go do this. And we'll hear more from Mr. B. Exactly. Sure. But what's he doing with fifty six pounds in Idaho? Dude, yeah, at least take I at think... least take a whole box. If you're gonna go, take a whole box, bro. Not half a box, like a, just over <laughs> half a box. Hold on, but. Hold, hold on, but let, let, maybe, maybe, maybe you got rid of, part, maybe you got rid of some, of, some of these packs. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, you guys. Let, 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 let's, let, let's take a step back of this for a second, okay? Dana Beal is seriously old. He's, he's a senior citizen, okay? He's yeah, a senior citizen. Yeah, that is exactly where I'm going with this, Rico. Exactly where I'm going with this. He's going to get sentenced to 15 years. The judge is going to give him the maximum sentence because they're going to try to turn it on to a clown show because they already have Adam Englander involved, and he's the he's the captain of clown shows and kangaroo courts. Okay, he's going to have all these activists jump and, and jump and jump, uh, put on these little Joker hats for the courtroom and whatnot. The judge is going to mm -hmm. get pissed off. Is going to sentence him to the maximum sentence and the maximum fine, and he very well may die. In jail he is a repeat offender this isn't the first time he's been mm -hmm. busted and, and not and, the first time he's forgotten an air freshener exactly what the fuck <laughs> yeah he right. um um i don't know man like, the, the fact that he was on the right side and all this other stuff it just does not matter and i think it paints the industry in a bad light because they're like oh yeah these guys are still doing mm -hmm. illegal shit and they will probably uh go back to their trapping ways uh, mm -hmm. if they had the opportunity because they can't resist that bait um so yeah this guy's gonna die in jail like unfortunately he's and didn't they say that yeah, he was and... taking cannabis from oregon to new york right so like yep. that was the whole mission so like that mission is so dead and failed and no and non-supply chain aligned at this point if you have yeah. to go out of, if you have to go to Oregon for a good, good to get it to New York, like there's a lot of extra biomass in New York last week, checked. So I just think the whole thing is, it's really sad. And for this guy to spend his final days in jail it is both tragic and also, if this is the decision process, foreseeable. Mm -hmm. Must be just broke because why else would you do it besides for right? money? Right. Right. He just must be broke. Mm hmm. I, I'm with you, man. Yeah, if you, he's not going to be homeless you know, anymore. Yeah, definitely. Price, prices, the price to live in New York is cost to live in New York is crazy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and mm -hmm. you know how our government's treating that. I mean, it's it's just wild. That's right. If you own real estate in New York, York they might just take it together. away. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we're going to keep this train rolling. We're going to keep this train rolling. we got to roll right into Miss Elise Roberts, who happens to be joining us today on a Tuesday. She is the Hashinista and based out of Northern California as well as Emerald Cup Judge. She's got a very fascinating story for you guys that's uh, that's very, very interesting. I can't wait to hear it. That's right. It is none other than Miss Elise McRoberts. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's nice to be here on a Tuesday. And I'm really excited about our special guest, Miss Jackie Bryant, joining us. For those who don't know, Jackie Bryant is an award winning journalist and blogger and the managing editor of San Diego Magazine. And the story I'm covering today is not written by Jackie Bryant, but it's about Jackie Bryant's experience with the payment company Stripe via her blog, Cannabis, on Substack. So this story comes from High Times Magazine. It was published yesterday, and so you can find it on our High Nine News website, the link there, and read the full article. I'm going to summarize, then we're going to talk to Jackie about it. But basically, Jackie had a blog on Substack, which is a platform for independent journalists, and you can earn revenue through it. And her blog, Cannabis, covered, obviously, cannabis um, stories of various sorts. And she was able to generate revenue through it uh, via her subscribers and followers. And then um, suddenly she was received an email from Stripe, the payments company, saying that she could no longer accept payments because it violated their terms. And so I will read the terms of Stripe payments, which the High Times article goes into. And the, if you look at the Stripe payment terms, they are immediately suspending any and all services to you and the access of Stripe technology if you breach this agreement of any other, oh, sorry, agreement of any other parties. So the contract is, um, the policy specifically includes only the following policies, cannabis dispensaries and related businesses, CBD products with THC levels that are greater than the applicable local jurisdiction's legal limit, including CBD edibles, hydroponic equipment and other cultivation or product equipment marketed for growing marijuana, courses and information on cultivating marijuana. So those are the items that if you're covering or writing about those, supposedly you cannot accept payments from Stripe. So only one of those three really applied to cannabis, which would be the um, courses and information potentially. Obviously, Jackie was not selling anything. She was just providing journalism stories. And so Jackie went to, uh, we kept the blog going, but then, you know, it stopped accepting payments, tried to fight Stripe. They basically said, no, we're not changing our view. And then the good news of this story is actually by the time this High Times article was posted, Stripe did reinstate Jackie's ability to take payments on Substack. And so in the end, Jackie won this war. However, the article does go into to talk about why this was an issue larger than just, you know, a journalist losing their ability to generate revenue, something that every journalist needs and deserves, um, as it's harder and harder for journalists to even make a living but also how this story really ties capitalism to free speech and, you know, what these, these policies and payments mean when journalists cannot, you know, again, earn revenue simply for talking or writing about cannabis. So while this is a great story that, you know, Jackie fought the good fight and she won and we've got visibility on it, um, we know there are many operators losing this fight and not be being able to take payments, not just for probably journalism, but obviously their products. But I will stop there and let Jackie chime in. And Jackie, what? Tell us about your experience, if you don't mind. And yeah, it was. Uh, it's been kind of a crazy few weeks. So um, I got an email from Stripe out of the blue. Yeah. Apparently, they changed their um, financial regulations due to uh, some pass down from from federal advice at the beginning of this year. I, I actually don't really know what I that missed was anything but what it was like going through oh you're good i'm good okay sorry about that um so yeah Th those terms of sale were not actually in place when i started my stripe account and my Substack account about four years ago it was um may april may 2020 so those were new. I had no idea that, that they were happening. And apparently, since those regulations have come down, Stripe has been auditing its accounts. So the first notification I got, very interestingly, was 
them telling me that they looked at my subscriber list and they said that there were many restricted businesses on the subscriber list. Mm -hmm. I, I said that is 100% not my problem. Like I can't control who subscribes and I won't. And uh, you know, if, if, if that happens to come from a cannabis company. So FYI Stripe is like auditing subscribers. And so they kind of like just asked me, kept asking me for more information. And then I kept giving it. And then they kept saying, oh, you didn't respond. So we're going to cancel your account further. And I kept repassing the information, et cetera, et cetera. We went back and forth for a few weeks. And then finally they said, okay, well, you're linking to cannabis businesses and businesses that sell cannabis paraphernalia. So that's in violation. Completely different reasoning. By this point, Substack had gotten involved. I had, um, made enough, uh, you know, noise publicly that they responded to me without even reaching out. And, um, they weren't like totally helpful, uh, truthfully, but they did get me information that I wouldn't have gotten on my own. Um, they were not really helpful in advocating for me, I don't think. But, um, at some point I just dropped, you know, I have an article coming out, they will be reaching out for comment. And then honestly, and they said, it, it, whatever, we don't care, you're done, you're toast. And they definitively denied me five separate times last week. Um, I have all of that co correspondence. And then I woke up on Friday morning and I had an email and they said, uh, we re reviewed your account and you're, you're good to process. Now, Claire Sawson, the um, excellent journalist who wrote that High Times article and, and, and did a really great job researching and outlaying it, um, I was very proud and happy that she just didn't go rah, 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 pot's good, you know, we're good, you're bad. Like, she really went into the terms of service and, like, really investigated and, like, showed exactly, you know, the hypocrisy and the things that weren't right there, which is really important for this. I think we, it's important we take that, like, activism anger a step beyond and, and really show the facts. So she did a nice job there. But, yeah, Claire asked for comment, I understand, from Stripe and Substack on Thursday. And by Friday, my account was reinstated. So I wasn't sure if High Times was a big enough publication to move the needle. Obviously it is, but it is a niche cannabis publication. And I know from being in media that cannabis media often gets denigrated, not counted as like the real authority in terms of mainstream media. It's just the truth. And, 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 and that's another stigma that I've been finding kind of my whole career. Um, but I guess it did. I don't know. I don't know. I guess it did move the needle because after she asked for comments, suddenly my account was reinstated. So there's a lot of lessons here, but there's other people I've talked to, like make a king of cash color cannabis. He's he's a black man and he has a sub stack and he lost his battle with Stripe and he is not has not been able to reinstate for over a year now. He has a smaller audience than me. Um, he's not as loud as me. I don't you know, for whatever reason that is. And so I think it needs to be shown that like certain operators, just by virtue of maybe who they are or the connections they have or whatever, it's not going to work for them. Like the only reason I think this worked for me is because I'm a 38 year old white woman with the Karen in my bones. And if someone comes for me, I'm going to go fucking nuts on them. And so that's exactly what happened. And I used all of my connections to do that. Not everybody has that. And so I think that's a really big issue that needs to be talked about here. Um, I, I won because I'm a fucking pain in the ass, I, I think is honestly really what happened happened and i'm proud of that and frankly but um yeah it's been kind of wild so, but so, i uh so you're the dana you know, bill you're the dana I, bill I of payments them, i'm not changing Jackie? my content i'll have an unpaid newsletter and i was gonna sort of ride that wave as the most illegal newsletter in cannabis but i guess i can't do that anymore so <laughs> so you're the dana bill of of uh of, of payments for journalists no this is this is amazing. I did think that during that story, I was like, I mm -hmm. being See? like this." No, this is this is a fantastic story. Okay, cool. It's been fucking crazy. I can't. Well, so the reason why I think I got nailed is because Jack, I have mad respect, um, Hannah, in my name, right? Like, so I'm the first one, I guess, that they were like. Okay, you're really and bitch. We, yeah, the bitch thing doesn't help either. Probably <laughs> you were it selling help. journalism, help. not weed. That doesn't. That's help. what I said. And, and they're like, "Well, you're linking and advocating," and I'm like, "I can't." You know, listen. Yeah, but I that's not in their terms of contract. That wasn't like in their terms of contract. Defendant for defamation cases, and I, you know, I have had to defend myself in much more serious ways. And I also testify in federal court as an expert witness um, for, for defense for cannabis cases. Like I'm not like, I don't know. And I know what I'm doing and I cross my T's and dot my I's. So it's just kind of wild to me that I can do all that and I can defend myself in court and win. And that, you know, against things like that in terms of free speech 
and then I can't even fucking link to a bong and say, I like this bong. Mm -hmm. absolutely melts my brain and it and it for me this is like this is why i do the work like the hypocrisy like weed to me i love weed love it medically think it has great benefits but at the end of the day it's fucking weed it is really not that big of a deal and it's it's insane the way everybody spins out over it and so for me like that line that line of hypocrisy that line of spinning out is what i'm totally obsessed with i have a book deal i'm, I'm working on right now that's very largely centered around that and the history of it and um kind of funny that this happened to me because now i have a nice a nice example like we'll add on to. Well, yeah, you have a chapter um, now yeah, yeah, I was going to say, they've, yeah. they've done you a favor by by doing this to you because they picked on the wrong Karen, obviously, right? And 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 so now you get to turn this negative into a positive and yet another example and content to write about. I don't know that it's protected free speech because there is this yeah, commerce exactly. component, right? And, and, and so, you know, when you link to a bong, you know, there are, somebody's argument is, well, you, you know, you're promoting the sale or people using this and this and that. But the problem is it's such a slippery slope, right? Do we, mm -hmm. do we stop all chat forums for people who lack guns because there's crazy people who are shooting up schools these days? Do we not let people talk about uh, taking the catalytic converter off of a race car when they're at Sears Point Raceway because – they're advocating for doing something that is illegal like to the vehicle. Child pornography. That's the only content we say you can't have and engage with and link to and share on the internet. Yeah, I mean, right. you, you you bested me with the Chomo example, but but this whole notion that you're not allowed to talk about things because you're one or two degrees away mm -hmm. uh, of separation from something that could be not allowed in a certain state. Uh, it, it is crazy, is crazy. And, 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 and God bless them for, for, for making the pivot. And to I your point, them profusely after cursing them out and literally telling them to go to hell. Multiple so I, I, that's kind of what date night looks like for me and Heather, right? Like, fuck you, love you, fuck you, love you, what you want to do. But anyway, so I, I totally get that, but I, I really appreciated the way you contextualized your journey with other people who are also writing and promoting and amplifying and talking about and how some of them aren't having the same outcomes either because they don't have the same fight or they don't have the same follower count. So like really God bless you, not only for what you're right, doing, but also matters. for talking about the way it impacts all of the writers and not just your own journey. Yeah. Big, big time respect to you, Jackie. I, as a, as a business owner who uses Stripe um, as a primary source to, uh, to get revenue it's uh awesome a first of all that there's a precedent now set um also by strong woman as you know i'm a partner in a woman uh founded company on on that business so it's like this is uh super dope you're a fucking warrior and also you know fuck stripe for trying to like do that to you and fuck stripe for doing that to other people that are not selling any cannabis goods it's like get your head out of your ass this is you're impeding the the revenue of like independent journalists entrepreneurs small businesses shame on mm -hmm. you guys shame Let's on make you. another on, point because i do work in media and you know my husband is a journalist as well he's been he's an investigative journalist who is quite decorated went to columbia journalism school has written about criminal cops etc he was laid off in july he still doesn't have work and is having a very hard time finding work because that type of journalism isn't really funded anymore and and no one's really yeah. interested in it because media is turning into 100% just a connected tool, like I said in the article, for you know, a tool for the wealthy and connected. It is a marketing. Propaganda. Yeah, it, it's I'm propaganda. Honest. If someone exactly. doesn't like what you say, you can sue them into oblivion. <laughs> it happened to me. There is a very large California cannabis company that there's a reason I work at a lifestyle magazine now. They intimidated the fuck out of me, and I needed to like save my mental health. And a lot of people watching this will know exactly what company wow. I'm talking about. Wow. Ja oh, Jackie, we, we definitely appreciate. Yeah. That. So like, you know, it just it's part that. of that. It's like you take away, you know. So it's just so because. Mom, well, again, it's go ahead, go ahead, Rico, go ahead. No, 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 we, no, we appreciate uh, 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 Elise joining us today and, and, and covering the story and, and Jackie, you joining us today and telling your side of it, like this is awesome. Um, I'm sorry this is happening to you, especially Stripe being a California based company, like fuck them. Like, yeah. you know, like, never, we gotta, we, 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 we gotta go, you guys, we're way over time. We gotta go to a commercial. We gotta go to a commercial. We're gonna be right back. Email. I think your Stripe account was just canceled. We gotta go to a commercial. We gotta go to a commercial. We're gonna be back.
<laughs> the control tower from Highly Educated has perfected the dab. Utilizing the concept of thin film evaporation, you can waste none of it and taste all of it. The micro texture of the SE pillar increases nucleation at elevated temperatures. And with the tower propelling at 2600 RPMs, it's certainly the most efficient dab experience to date. The control tower from Highly Educated. Uh, stop whatever you're right. doing. Make sure you hit that like button down below as well as subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And all of the articles that we cover on today's show you can read directly on our website at www.highat9news.com. I'm Jason Beck, and this is Smoky Vanilla. And if you want to feel as good as I look, then you need to get yourself a stretch and smoke with Smoky Vanilla. That's right, baby. I'm Smoky Vanilla with my background in kinesiology. I'm a sports massage therapist and stretch coach. I focus mostly on athletes who have chronic pain or injury due to their sport or the legends of the chronic in the game, baby. Oh, Yee! yeah. You know what it is. We just stretched and now we're going to smoke because you know what it is. That's right. I love intuitively creating a session based on the individual I'm working with. We'll go through a few assessments, look at the past health history, injury, or anything that's still affecting you today, and create a customized session just for you. Let's go. Yee! My husband was like, wow, you're- Oh, hold on. We're back. We're back, Jackie. We're back. We're back. We're back. Go ahead, Rico. Up next, we got a 30-year media producer, director, editor, and the golden tongue of the Las Vegas Strip. Granddaddy Perp himself comes to the stage, Mr. Todd Duncan. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, I thank you as the crowd goes wild. Jason, we have a... Uh... I'm of your team misbehaving. Oh, stop it. <laughs> My team does not misbehave. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> get him, Todd. I can't wait for this one. Mm -hmm. I cannot right. wait. House GOP committee urges opposition to marijuana banking bill, saying that marijuana is, and I quote, a gateway drug that causes violence, depression, and suicide. The Republican House Advisory Committee is formally opposing marijuana banking legislation and a separate bill to remove past cannabis use as a disqualifying factor for federal employment and security clearances, while broadly criticizing the substance as a gateway drug that causes violence, depression, and suicide. The House Republican Policy Committee's new marijuana report also says that Vice President Kamala Harris was mistaken when she said cannabis brings people joy as a 2020 presidential candidate, instead arguing that it is a hazardous drug with short and long-term impacts. The guidance, which is meant to inform how the GOP caucus should approach, approach marijuana policy issues, briefly describes the history of prohibition in the state legalization movement. It then makes the case that cannabis is a dangerous substance linked to mental health disorders such as schizophrenia, attributing that in part the high concentration of THC. The committee also cited questionable statistics to argue that state-level legalization is associated with increased violence. It claimed that marijuana use causes workplace issues, such as decreased productivity, high unemployment claims, and lawsuits. The guidance says... Instead of turning a blind eye to the dangers associated with marijuana and allowing states to have dispensaries on every corner, Congress should work to ensure that laws in relation to marijuana are enforced. It included two specific policy recommendations, stating that members should oppose the Secure and Fair Enforcement Banking Act, the Safe Banking Act, and the Cannabis Users Restoration of Eligibility Act, also known as the CURE Act. That's despite the fact that both measures enjoy bipartisan support, and certain members of the policy committee, such as Representatives Tom McClintock, a Republican from California, and Nancy Mace, also a Republican from South Carolina, have been vocal champions of marijuana reform. McClintock has signed on to the banking bill, and Mace is the lead GOP co-sponsor of the Federal Employment and Security Clearance Measure. The CURE Act, which would prevent the denial of federal employment or security clearances based on a candidate's past marijuana use, Passed the Oversight Committee in a 30 to 14 vote last September, with 10 Republicans joining Democrats to advance it. 
The House has approved different versions of the Safe Banking Act with bipartisan support seven times in recent sessions. The current version has 106 co-sponsors, including 24 GOP members. The new GOP policy guide, which was quietly posted to the body's website last month, includes that marijuana is a dangerous, addictive drug with no mechanism to control rogue producers from increasing potency and causing more harm. Rather than labeling marijuana as a recreational drug, it should be labeled for what it is, a gateway drug that increases schizophrenia and impairs cognitive ability. Their website says the job of the committee, whose chair is the fourth-ranking member of House Republican leadership, provides a forum for Republican members to discuss legislative proposals and current topics before the House and produces issue backgrounders and conservative policy solutions to the House Republican conference. Previously, the policy committee also urged the caucus to hold firm in opposition to marijuana legalization in a letter uh, dated back in 2022 ahead of a vote to pass the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. Also that year, Separate Republican Study Committee released a family policy agenda that expressed opposition to federal marijuana legalization and similarly attempt to link cannabis use to suicide and violence. I'm Todd Dankin with TNN with, uh, with with Hyatt Nine News. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> with who am I with today, right? Um, and and literally, who on this panel is suffering right now from depression, suicidal thoughts, and they want to go? Commit some violence because they're smoking weed. Uh, I'm not, uh, not me. I mean, c- come on, Todd. You know this is all. No, I'm just taking a huge song right now. I'm loving life I'm play personally. Play. So me too. I hear you. This is this, this is all this is all the work of Kevin Sabet and the avid I'm gonna go, I'm, gonna go grab, I'm gonna go grab some white women. This is and play some jazz. Wait, raise your hand if you're blocked by Kevin Sabet. <laughs> <laughs> on social media, on Twitter, anybody yeah. else? Oh, I, do not, I do not want to be blocked okay. by Kevin Sabet. I, want oh, to I sure. totally heard, like. I asked him no. how he was funded a few times, which he doesn't like. He doesn't he like that question. No, that. he doesn't. I'm yeah. uh, I'm I'm almost out of weed, so I might throw something later. I don't know. You know, that's ah answer. the violence. 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 The only thing you're going to be throwing some on is your tray, your rolling tray. Okay, <laughs> that's going to be the only thing that you're throwing. Right All right. Get out of or here. Or maybe maybe Get it'll be the here. timer because it'll take you so much longer to roll a blunt that time. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. Guys, you guys can't rush perfection. That's the one thing I want to tell you. Right <laughs> so, Jason, could you make a couple of calls to the red it, team it, Todd, and say what the fuck? Yeah, but, but but that's the whole thing. What what was what committee was this, Todd? What committee? Oh, this was the I'm lame ass committee, I'm sure. That's my point. No, so they, they guys, well, guys, no, focus it's on the family House Republican them, Policy not, Committee. The what? The, the what? The hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What what what's the title of it, Todd? It is the uh the House Republican. Who's uh, on it? Out of curiosity. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Well, the, uh, let, the let's get the name of the it first. Fourth highest ranking Republican. What, what, so, what's the name of the committee? You said House Republican, that was it. I'm looking for it, bro. Okay, all right. A Republican House Committee, and then the House Republican Committee. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Jason, getting Jason, getting up and I'm just right saying. Here, I'm just man. saying. Oh, let, let, Jason, let, let, let's get some Jason facts, because all I'm know. all I'm hearing is these vague, vague, vague maskisms that Dem- Democrats love to throw out there. No, no, no. What you're what hearing? Do you mean? Go to their website. No, no, no. Let, let, let's stop. Stop the madness. What you're hearing is that Republicans' opinions are for sale devoid of current scientific information. And it would make me upset too if I was you, because as we fumble for the name of the committee, but we accurately identify that the number four Republican in the that House doesn't matter. is on board with this. I want to what know the name of the committee. What, what you come up against is this stark reality that your party doesn't support what's important to you. And it's okay because I'm here be for right. the hug you need right now. <laughs> but the <laughs> truth is the Republicans have hey. been fucking you for so long. No, the reality, no, the reality, the, no, the reality of it is this, is that the Republican Party has been hijacked by all these rhinos, which stands for Republican oh, in name only. And that so is the, really, they're, they're not, they're not right? true yeah, freedom the lovers. Party. They're, 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 they're not hijacked. none of that. That. Don't tread on me. You've been hijacked since the religious right decided yeah, that this women is a natural don't deserve abortion. Last 20 years. You've been hijacked in Florida. 
You've been hijacked for so long that you wouldn't know what to do if you weren't a prisoner and you've become familiar prisoner, with it. Bro. And so let's prisoner. talk about it here because I've got you and there's a shoulder to cry on. You could even snot on You're this so sweater. I don't even care about it. Yaro, you'd have to call the crylocopter for me. Dad mode. Yeah. With the hour. Committee is called the House Republican Policy it, it, Committee. It, it, it's oh, called God, all of your party, Sorry, bro. Was... All of your party. This bro. doesn't matter. Yes. Why yeah, is yeah, it? Why you. is it that that this, opinion is for this sale? Doesn't, this doesn't really Religion. matter. Yeah, it, Religion. It, it, all, all I mean, you want to talk it, about it, opinions for sale? We can go into Joe Biden all day. You want to talk about opinions for sale? Selling our national secrets and all this stuff, bro. Like, let's not even go there. That's cute though, Yaro. It just adds <laughs> mm -hmm. adds to more concrete proof that the Republicans are taking the anti-cannabis stance, right? 100%. They're just it's, taking it's the anti-cannabis stance. It's, and it's not that it's not get... that Republicans are taking the stance. It's that those those guys want um, you know to impose some kind of like you know existential uh kind of rule uh upon this country kind of like how sharia law works in different countries right well, so it's like look oh, that, are, I, I, I talked feel, about it earlier you know i feel this the democrats yeah I, I just it's feel, a small it's a it's not the it's not the majority of that party I, I, I and i don't the think democrats, that's like uh, the, um, uh, actually finally doing i just think it's a lot of doom and gloom just, when it comes to cannabis and the republicans when you put them in the same conversation it's a lot I of think, doom and gloom but i think in reality it's the majority of uh i, I, think, I, I think the democrats, the democrats are finally it. taking a concrete stance on cannabis yeah. and the and the republicans can't help but take the diametrically opposed stance to, i mean yeah, i mean that's you can't lump them all together look at nancy However, Mace. here's how we feel about it and more positivity. I don't know. I think you guys are all well, crying uh, over, over nothing. Uh, kind of getting silenced lately. I don't even see why this is even really news, in all honesty. <laughs> yeah, I really don't. Not. I mean, why I'm not surprised. Called out as a rhino by a lot of these right? I mean, I'm not surprised. We all know that there's that there's some opposition the on, on, on the right. It's not just like news. there's there's opposition from the from the left too on this on this same subject. So uh, not yeah. like the red dudes, bro. Come on. Not like the red dudes. <laughs> you know what? We're going to be right back. We're going to go to commercial. We're going to be right back. And I won't let it go. Mm -hmm. Well, either way. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Come on. Get ready for the return of the shit show to Los Angeles. Returning Friday, May 3rd, 7 p.m. to midnight at a brand new venue. Comedy sets by comedians such as Demi York, Lindsay Ames, Alyssa Phillips, Chris Thayer, Josh Shakespeare, Fumi Abi, Jay Snow, Brent Weinbach, Chris Kelly, and hosted by none other than Abdullah Saeed. So head over to www.cloudmedia.partners now to get your tickets, and we'll see you there. Oh, yes, you guys. Coming up next. Coming up next. It is the man who... He is a chemist. He is a solvent extraordinaire, and apparently he helps women over 50 how to say hello again. That's right. He's back from <laughs> Spain, and is none other than Mr. Saman Rizani. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good to be back. Hello. Sorry I missed your beautiful faces for a couple weeks um, as, I, as I was traveling around in spanibus and had a wonderful time a uh, lot to share a lot to report just amazing vibes um amazing community in barcelona we had a fantastic time and uh we had a had the opportunity to uh connect with some amazing people from all across the globe uh shout out costa rica colombia brazil italy our homies in italy and uh, of course um france toulouse we met some hash makers and growers from all across costa brava and um from lots of different countries and it was just fantastic so mad wow. respect uh thanks for thanks for having us and hosting us uh, in our crazy ca uh, American cannabis ways, but um, you know, smoking just weed in the joints—that's <laughs> that's pretty wild. Um, but anyways, uh, I have a story for you guys from Spanibus. It was a pretty wild time while we were out there. Um, unfortunately, um, as as we still see with uh, the pejorative nature of our colleagues discussing cannabis in America, it's still discussed this way in other countries. Um, I learned a lot about Spain. I learned a lot about Barcelona and and how they have. Um, the laws they have and just the history of Catalan in general. And um, it's uh, 
it's interesting the laws that kind of prop up their social club scene there are are based on like heroin uh rules from long ago they used to like you know what a concept right it's get the people into a safe place to use what they have to use um and get it off the street so that's kind of the you know it's part and parcel of how they are are conducting business now but there is no other rules there is no other laws um that are written specifically for cultivation not even caregiver rules they can they can kind of get away with stuff um a little bit but it's uh it's 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 very complicated. And as we saw while we were there, they were raiding a lot of the big social clubs um, and there was a lot of undercover uh, agent activity um, near the um, near a lot of the clubs. And some people, some of our friends from other countries got stopped on the street and they were targeted, they were profiled. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it resulted in them getting, in some cases, um, you know, their their cannabis taken. Uh, I think there was an instance of somebody actually doing a couple of days in jail. They got pulled over and they had some cannabis with them. So it's, uh, it, you know, they did. They're dealing with the same things we're dealing with. Um, and as everybody knows, you know, we're we're big social justice advocates uh, for cannabis um, and uh, across the globe. That doesn't that doesn't just mean here domestically. That means everywhere where there's a cannabis prisoner there's some injustice and like you know some something has to hopefully change in, in spain but regardless it was a great time and this article is from lindsey bartlett um and with such an apt title at spanibus cult cannabis culture is unstoppable despite the crackdowns um so here we go spanibus is a hybrid it offers up two realities, a peaceful and passionate modern cannabis culture that thrives in the underground versus an old guard of conservative officials who aim to stamp it out. The international cannabis community congregates en masse at Spanibus. In its 20th year, Spanibus is the most packed consumer weed festival I have ever been to in my life, standing room only. An estimated crowd of more than 25,000 attendees found themselves at the Fira Cornella in Barcelona, Spain, over the course of the week leading up to March 15 through 17, 2024. The event organizers said over 500 companies from seed banks to ancillary were, pre were represented on the floor this year. In one reality, cannabis is a decriminalized and celebrated plant a medical healing mo modality with a vibrant subculture. The peaceful social clubs offer safe havens for weed refugees. Meanwhile, in another reality, Barcelona's conservative city officials performed mass raids on the clubs during the week leading up to the main event. The raids targeted over 15 private clubs around the city on March 13, 2024, seeking to collect fines, take product, and slap patrons with, with costly consumption tickets. The cannabis, subcult the, the cannabis culture is unstoppable, says criminal attorney Marta de Luxan Marco of the law offices of de Luxan and Nieto de in Spain. The entire cannabis industry has emerged from illegality. Even though it generates millions of euros in its legal and illegal markets, it is increasingly persecuted in Spain. While other countries replicate our club model, Barcelona City Council seems to have the intention of closing it but we are not going to let them. The clubs emerge as a response from civil society to the lack of regulation. People risk their freedom to try to ensure that politicians understand that legalization is more beneficial to society than prohibition. The clubs are decriminalized private establishments that offer up vibes similar to the coffee shops of Amsterdam. The, their founders are committed, are committed members of the cannabis community in Barcelona and represent an amalgam of the international industry leaders. The lawyer explains that even if the city ever did manage to close the clubs, which she believes is highly unlikely, consumers will smoke weed and the industry will carry on growing regardless of the risk. We will continue disobeying an absurd rule that threatens our freedom of choice, says the Luxan Marco. She was, she was part of a powerhouse panel of women in cannabis at La Calada, the original female-centric speaker series during Spanibus Week for six years running. Deluxe and, Marco, uh, Deluxe and Marco's head shop called Stoner Supermarket recently moved from Madrid to Barcelona, a city that has been safer for cannabis businesses historically. The reality is that according to surveys, a high percentage of the population is in favor of legalization. Time has shown that the war on drugs is absolutely ineffective, says Deluxe and Marco. That's one of the reasons it is now regulated for half the world. In my opinion, the regulators and conservative leaders 
uh, are more representative of the hypocrisy that exists in Spain in relation to drug consumption than the social reality of the country, she says. The attorney explains that fine for possession or consumption on public roads range from 600 to 1 to 30,000 euros, or in harsh cases, can lead to prison sentences. We have never stopped consuming cannabis, and our industry has not stopped flourishing. Despite the lack of light and legal insecurity caused by the lack of uh, regulation, says Deluxe San Marco, it is probably the longest civil disobedience movement in history. Spanish officials are pretending that the thriving, Sp thriving cannabis culture does not exist. Other locals believe that the goal was to instill fear to permeate the weekend's show. The same fear tactics that those who have lived through the war on drugs know well. We are in the drug war. It's full-fledged. There's a revolution happening here, and I am honored to be a part of it, says Luna Stauer, chief impact officer for iSpire on Instagram. It's cool to be able to come to a city that doesn't have legal weed in the middle of a time where the clubs are raided, and at the same time, uh, in a coordinated sting across the city, we're having award ceremonies for outstanding businesses. It's so ironic that we're able to do these normalization moves to try to uh, sophisticate and elevate the scene, and you still got this low vibrational fear-based attack on our community happening in real time. And that's uh, that's the story. Um, I feel like this, uh, you know, that the vibe in Spain was that there's a there is a heightened sense of like just this rebel nature, um, and everyone there is, you know, doing their part, and they're still, you know, way more in the shadows than we are here. So mad respect to all of our comrades over there fighting the good fight, and mad respect to Lindsay and to Luna for for uh, sharing their opinions with us on the weekend and um, just on the on the general just sense of things. So thanks a lot. Um, please, guys, share your thoughts with us in the comments. And uh, my, pan, my esteemed panelists and our guests, I'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah, I've got some thoughts if I can. Um, so I, my, I'm my i remarried now, but my ex-husband is Catalan from Barcelona, from the city. And so I used to live there. And I kind of came up in the, in the cannabis club scene there beginning like 2009, 2010. And like they're, they're in. It is incredible what happened to the scene post COVID. It has exploded, it has matured, it has become more cosmopolitan, internationalized. Um, it is just true. I mean, they're, you know, as we know, they're doing hash now that never really used to kind of like be, a, you know, rosin and stuff like that. It, that kind of stuff never used to really be a thing. It's just incredible kind of watching it from the ground over the years and then also watching how quickly it deteriorated. And I just also want to make the point that those laws are rooted in old heroin laws. The heroin crisis that we're dealing with now in the United States happened in Spain in about the 80s and early 90s as the result of Franco dying, the government um, changing over to democracy and kind of um, opening up that, their economy and sort of joining the modern world from basically like Catholic feudalism to join the European community and eventually the European Union. And the result of that was a social movement called the Movida, which opened up it was their 60s, but in the 80s. Let's just put it that way. Pedro Almodovar, those movies are like mm -hmm. a legacy of that. And the, the the budding cannabis culture and the but, the budding anarchist culture in Barcelona, the squatter culture, the street culture, the skate culture, all came out of that. And so, unfortunately, did the heroin culture. And so they went through a lot in the 90s and, and as a result, have really draconian drug laws. And, and this is all a legacy of that. And it really liberalized in the early 2000s. And socially, they had a dem you know a more democratic government, and you know they're they're experiencing the shadows of Francoism never really went away. Their fascism never really went away. It's bubbling up like it is in the United States, and uh, the drug laws are very much part of that culture war there too. Yeah, but the thing about fascism in Spain is that it tastes way better than fascism any place else, right? It's, it's got that, it's in their it, blood. It's got I a little know. bit of that, you know. I tangoed with that with my my ex husband and a nationalist, and it was oh my god, it was a big part of our lives still today, you know, and and that Catalan nationalism, that anti fascism, you know, I mean, he was raised in that, and I, I had a lot of anarchist and communist friends because it's it's quite popular there because of that. It's um it's very different, and so yeah, and the flip side makes that fascism very comfy, attractive. It's baked into their government and their culture and their Catholicism, which is the state religion, and. Yeah, I'm I'm just really glad that when people go to this international event that arguably has as much cannabis culture as any any annual event 
that, and, and aside from the fact that this article is from an American publication, I love the fact that they're quoting people from Northern California, and that when we go deeper into the article and the parts that weren't as relevant for what Simon was covering, we can see that Frosty Hash won first place in Spanibus for Rosin with a Z Skittle offering, and that its founders, Madison and Jessica, are based in Sonoma County. So obviously I'm geocentric, but big props to NorCal, even on the world stage. Nice, yeah, I mean, Yara. like, nice. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Yaro. Like, uh, Spanibus, Dude. if you've never been, is probably like the coolest event that exists, do we know? Period. Do, do we know? Do we know what shops were actually raided? And and, Wait, and, and do we know what no, shops no. were actually raided? Yes, and yes, and did anyone actually like get arrested, raided. or like did they actually like yes, go in there yes, and take the yes. product people out? Or people got tickets, and there was uh, it says people, people like getting tickets is normal. Is normal. I'm that that that's not that's not what I'm asking. This I'm, happens I mean, every when, year. When, I mean, not clubs getting raided, but I went to Spanibus, and you know, it's out there for the full week, pre-COVID and post-COVID, a couple times, and I mean. Almost every year, people are getting arrested in some sort of. I, I understand the I understand the arrest. I'm I'm speaking in regards to the raids. I want to know about the raids. If people um were were actually like detained or uh taken out in handcuffs, anyone actually went to jail, or did they just go in there and just I take? Mean, yes, shit? people. Yes, there were people that were like taken to jail and had to do like a night or two there while they waited for their magistrate hearing or whatever. I mean, yes. Definitely, but I don't, you know, I'm not like... So they took, like, the out. owners to jail? No, I don't know. I don't know about that's that. What I'm, that's I what I'm in that particularly was, asking about. Look, I don't, I don't know exactly, you know, well, there was, like, 14 or 15, it says. There was, like, 14. Because well, so, you know, there, 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 there's a big difference. There's a big difference between, like, actual real raids and them just coming in and fucking shit up it, and then, you know, and then says, leaving. It says there was 14, it says there was 14 raids that, that were executed on the same day. So it was a coordinated effort. So I don't know if it was a shakedown, whatever it was. They come in there hot bunch of cops while you're trying to like throw events you know shit you know it's so it's not so, like so, so 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 justin justin in the chat he says that uh he says that hq was rated i have heard that they um, were rated they, they were yeah rated. They were and he says he says that that no one no one did go to jail that it was basically they basically just came in there just to just push their weight around and that, yeah, okay, and, that yeah. and that was it he I says it exactly. was not about real i mean there was so many it was not right? real but raids somebody went there was definitely somebody that was from california that got arrested with product in their car i don't know who it is exactly or i'm not gonna i don't know bro i smell i that smell an there, informant that is confirmed that i is smell confirmed. an informant that's it, what it, i smell it's that same guy from idaho he was over there too. He was just, uh, spreading it out trying to happen. figure out how he could get to you know to you know? ukraine mm -hmm. uh you know it's interesting though that the, the woman that they quote in this article owns a dispensary but she's also a criminal defense attorney and Unfortunately, yeah. with what we're sharing today, that's probably what it takes to be a good dispensary owner is you probably need a law degree in criminality just to be able to sidestep all the minefields in this hodgepodge approach to both prohibition and tolerance. Doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, you know, either way, it didn't really it didn't really stamp out anything. No one was really that concerned. But people, you know, I mean, if you were smart, you were just a little more uh, cautious and you were just, you know, what you were really looking out i mean you know it's hard it's hard not to just be in awe in that city it's so gorgeous and you're you know as somebody that's never traveled um to barcelona i was definitely on you know on some like oh i caught myself like looking up like a dumb tourist you know but that's just how it's it's an awesome place um but either way the 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 like i said the level of spirit that they have um rebellious spirit those people are are and and just generally you know i think it's just palpable in that city i think when you're there it just kind of takes you over so mad respect yeah shout out to the spaniards because after all they are conquerors the catalanes bro mm -hmm. and, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> We got to keep this train rolling. We're going to roll right on into Mr. Yaro D. Kubrin. He is the man who loves to sell real estate. He loves to sell a little bit of weed. And every now and again, he sells a big old grow. That's right. Don't you know? They'll sell the real estate and the weed all at the same time for the double bag. That's right. It's none other than Mr. Yaro Kubrin. <laughs>
You're on mute, Rico. You're on mute. There we go. There. You got to hit hit the mute button. It's on, no? Yo, you're on mute. You're on mute still, bro. There you go. Now now we hear you. Now you're good. It's going to be Darn all right, it. bro. It's going to be all right, bro. You're, you're it's going to be okay. It's good to be back. Clearly the coffee's kicking. Can't even figure out where the mute button is. It's because you called me Rico, which is both a... Um, uh, a compliment and a compliment. But anyway, said, yeah. my article today I'm is sorry. about edibles and about what happens when they're not locked up or kept in a childproof container. So we're going to go up to Canada for this one. This is CBC News, <laughs> not CBD News, but CBC. <laughs> my article today, women, woman who accidentally gave out cannabis edibles to Winnipeg trick-or-treaters sentenced to $5,000 in fines. Tammy Sigurdor pleaded guilty to handing out THC lace candy to kids in 2022. A woman who accidentally put cannabis candies in bags to hand out on Halloween after running out of loot for trick-or-treaters in 2022 broke down crying in a Winnipeg courtroom on Monday as a judge asked her to imagine what might have happened if a young child had eaten the drug lace candy she gave them. Tammy Sigildor was sentenced to pay a total of $5,000 in fines as part of a joint recommendation rec accepted by the judge for her role in handing out cannabis edibles, which court heard were not Sigildors and are made to look nearly identical to regular Nerds brand candy and can't be bought legally in Canada. The edibles ended up in trick-or-treat bags after Sigildor ran out of candy that night, then rushed to the closet in her house, which contained regular candy and cannabis edibles, looking for extras to give out court heard. Without her glasses on, Sigador filled plastic zipped sandwich bags with various candy and gum she found in the closet, not realizing about a dozen of the bags had edibles in them before she gave them out to her husband to hand out at the front door. Court heard the edibles had been bought for Sigador's husband who didn't notice they were in the sandwich bags before giving them out. The mistake didn't come to light until a parent discovered one of the edibles in their child's candy stash and contacted police, Crown Attorney Terry McComb said. I'm pretty sure you've thought about this innumerable, if not thousands of times, what would have happened had this parent not seen that label, Provincial Court Judge Raymond Wyatt said to Sigador in court on Monday. And the thought that some child could have ingested this THC, some very young child, and that it could have caused lasting injuries or death is almost too frightening to contemplate. Yes, Sigador replied through sobs, it is. Women pleaded guilty last year. Police said at the time of the incident, they got more than a dozen reports of cannabis candies being handed out to trick-or-treaters in Winnipeg's South Tuxedo neighborhood on October 31st, 2022. The officers later searched a home on Calarian Court Crescent in, in connection with the reports. Packaging suggested the edibles had 600 milligrams of the psychoactive property in cannabis known as THC. In, cannibal edibles, in Canada, edibles are legally only allowed to contain 10 milligrams per package. Children who received the edibles were 6 to 16 years old. None were harmed by the candies. Court heard Sigler's error came to her attention after people started posting about the cannabis edibles found in children's Halloween candy on a community social media page, and she recognized the zipped sandwich bags. Shortly after, her and her husband went to police and gave detailed, lengthy statements about what happened. Sigador pled guilty in September to possessing cannabis that's not packed, labeled, and stamped, and supplying the drug to a young person. Offenses under the Liquor, Gaming, and Cannabis Control Act after being arrested along with her husband shortly after Halloween in 2022. Charges against Sheldon Chikonov were stayed in November. I'm assuming that's her husband's name. I should have been more careful. Sigador's voice shook as she read a statement through tears in court on Monday, telling the judge how grateful she felt that no children were harmed because of her mistake. I don't expect forgiveness, and I'm not going to make excuses for what happened. I should have been more careful. I should have worn my glasses. I shouldn't have been rushing around trying to find candy, said Sigador, as her son sat behind her in the galley at times, holding back tears of his own. I also apologize if I have in any way caused distress to any children about Halloween and their safety and enjoyment of the holiday. It truly was an accident. And at no time did I have any desire to harm anybody, especially children. No parent should have to worry about their child receiving such a dangerous substance in their Halloween bag, and that was never my intention. Defense lawyer Saul Simons, better call Saul, said his client's mental health was seriously affected by the incident and that she has tortured herself from this from the moment this occurred at the thought that she could have even accidentally put any child at risk. Judge Wyatt said he accepted the incident and its fallout had a traumatic effect on Sigador, but still said he wanted to underscore the risk of potentially letting cannabis edibles fall into the wrong hands. If anything good comes of this hearing and the publicity that surrounds it, maybe that's it. 
and increase public awareness of the danger of these articles in the wrong hands and that inadvertently they can get into the wrong hands in ways that sometimes we can never contemplate but ultimately are responsible for, Wyatt said. Okay. What do y'all think? <laughs> Bummer. I, I, I love this story. This is so yeah. classic. This is like the, the, the Karen's gone bad all of a sudden when, when being a Karen goes wrong. I, I mean, look, there's made a mistake. Karen, though. She's torturing herself and taking responsibility and honestly torturing herself way too much. Like, listen, I have a 10 month old. I would be horrified if this happened and like there would be many chats, but like shit also happens. And I don't know, free Tammy at this point. Like, Jesus Christ, give the lady a break. I've, I've, also, I've, I listen again, I have a 10 month old and I am not trying to minimize this at all. I really, mm -hmm. I really am not. The kids <laughs> are not going to die if they eat the edibles. They're not going to die. They're not going to die. They're not going to die. And also, one more point that I'm done. Do you know how many DMs I get from parents whose children get into their own edibles, including infants, people I went to high school with who are like, hey, Jackie, I haven't talked to you in 20 years, but I know you're into weed, and what do I do? And I'm like, you'll be fine. Just watch them, you know, blah, 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 hydration, blah, 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 blah. But also call your doctor. I'm not a doctor. But <laughs> parents do it to their own kids, so like free Tammy. Oh, poor Tammy. It's, it's, it's interesting to me because – First of all, I don't understand hiding any candy in the closet because it's an edible. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. it's, it's food. So like we have a cabinet, yeah. not a closet. A so that's a little weird for me. Hey, honey, can you hand me the candy for Halloween? Yeah, it's by the socks in the closet. It's just a little, yeah. a, yeah. a little odd for me. To be clear. The, the second thing is, is like around here, sure. we've always known it was a little ghetto if you buy the big bag and you break it down into Ziploc baggies. Like that's a trapping mentality. But when it comes to candy and Halloween, like ain't nobody looking for the big bag of mints and then you're going to hand out one piece of chocolate and put it in your own little like sub bag. So that's just an interesting mindset for, for Halloween in general. Then the next thing that's interesting to me is none of the kids actually had a harm or ate it, but the other parents recognize it as trap product. So here you have this trap product in Canada that clearly wasn't acquired in a dispensary and that her husband was acquiring. And the other parents noticed that it was a trap brand. So those other parents are clearly probably buying from can the I tell same you, can, I tell, can I tell you <laughs> can I tell you what this really is? Can I tell you what this really is? This is this is this is basically a real drug deal gone bad, Yarrow. Okay, because this is this is this is what happened. Okay. So 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 the mom doesn't want to get outed that it's Halloween and she needs to re-up on her edibles. So she takes her kid trick-or-treating over to the house where she buys her drugs at and gives the other mom the winky wink to which they go and grab the special bag, drop the bag of candy into the kid's bag because parents check all the kids' candy, so then that way she can intercept the bag before the kids that. get it. Okay. And this is is a hundred percent a drug deal gone bad this lady yeah agree. This, is, this is agree this is agree. The trailer this is the trailer mm -hmm. park boy shit yeah this, this is this is this, this, this is what this is what actually <laughs> happened yarrow this, this, is like it tracks mm -hmm. like you know this cow is as dead as Canada. Yep. This, you know, but fortunately for her, that it was, uh, she was finding Canadian dollars because they're not as much as they're not as uh, much in value as U.S. dollars. That's the only country that the American dollar still has an advantage over, probably. No, there's a lot of them. Everywhere else, there's a lot of them. So not as, there's a lot of them. So so I don't know about that anymore. There's, there's buddy. tons of them. <laughs> tons, 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 tons. I'm, I'm being facetious, but you know, like. Uh, I mean, it sounds like she needs to ship her extra edibles to Spain because with all the ridiculous enforcement action over there. The people of Barcelona need some Skittles too. Mm -hmm. You can export from Canada. This lady needs to be like get into the entrepreneurial spirit there, Tammy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Tammy. Tammy. Pretty did. Tammy. I guess. Damn, Tam. right? I no, that's realize. not. A, that's not super entrepreneurial. That's more like a lemonade stand right. gone bad. Right. She I dipped her toes and she's like, I just. I just. No. I just want to know what the total Tam market is for her. Like. Tam. Tammy. Tam Quinn. Karen's little sister, Tammy.
Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for joining us for another episode of High at Nine News every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific and high noon on the East Coast. Big thank you to our audience tuning in, spending your time with us. And thank you to all of our correspondents today for tuning in and enjoying the show. I know we went a little overtime today, so I do apologize for that. But uh, there was a lot of a lot of stuff going on today. And uh, Miss Elise, since you are going to be not not with us for for a couple weeks, do you have anything that you'd like to say before we close out? I do actually. So if you're in the Bay Area, there's a rally tomorrow at Oakland City Hall at 3.30 p.m. You can find more information on Supernova Women and Last Prisoner Project. I will be there. We're going to be advocating for changes and talking about the differences between um, or what Schedule 3 really means. And um, beyond that, thank you everyone for joining us. It was a joy to be here. I hope you stay safe, stay lit, and uh, yeah. Plants yes. a plant. Tis the season. I love Grow it. something. And thank you all for tuning in to Hyatt Nine <laughs> News. We Jackie, are America's sorry. number Jackie. one daily cannabis news show.